this is the Rebel Author Podcast, where we talk about books, business, and occasionally bad words. Hello, Rebels, and welcome to episode 107 of the Rebel Author Podcast. Today, I am talking to returning Rebel, Becca Puglisi, and we are discussing her brand new thesaurus, the Conflict Thesaurus, that she co-wrote with Angela Ackerman. We dive into how to uh, improve your conflict, how to raise the stakes, how to help yourself... um, (laughs) what am I trying to say? How to deepen your characterization uh, all using conflict. Uh, but first, last week's question was, tell me something you have achieved this year. Dharma Keller said, um, I have published one thriller in June, set up my website for selling ebooks and signed prints book, print books directly. And in December, I will publish my first nonfiction book. I'm feeling great about what I've accomplished. And so you should. That is a huge amount for this year. Kate Holdsworth says my achievement this year is to learn to narrate slash edit master my own audiobooks and watch them sell in the wild so I'm not sure if that means you've done it or if you're going to do it Um, but either way I think that is a cracking uh, one Uh, and then a couple of comments about the episode itself Emily Hand said this is so perfectly timed for me Andrew Kimbop said I was actually going to sit down and start my second draft this evening when the kids are in bed perfect timing and Karen Heenan said um, her suggestion about editing the five important scenes first was really good I'll have to try that yeah and I am trying to remember that I don't have to edit chronologically as well because I think that was one of the most hard-hitting points uh, from the episode last week So um, this week's question is, what is the best book you've read in your genre? So what is the best book you've read this year uh, in your genre? Oh, not this year, actually, I changed my mind. At at any point you can have read it. But yeah, what is the best book in your genre that you have read and found and loved? Okay, so the book recommendation this week is different. It is an audio book and it is my audiobook because finally 13 Steps to Evil How to Craft a Super Bad Villain is live in audiobook. It is of course written and narrated by me um, so if you enjoy this podcast and would like to hear more of my dulcet tones um, or perhaps you would like to see how it turned out or maybe you want to improve your villainous characters either way you can go and check out 13 Steps to Evil How to Craft a Super Bad Villain in audiobook paperback or ebook for that matter um, on any of the normal audiobook stores Uh, you can also I am hoping by now you will be able to um, buy it direct from me as well Uh, I'm having a few issues getting it uploaded but I'm working with book funnel so hopefully by the time this airs it will be live on my website as well And of course, you can also order it from your library. I did go wide with audio. So um, yeah, I don't think there's any reason why you shouldn't be able to check it out. (laughs) Okay, so personal update. It's been another wonderful week. (laughs) I'm really positive and happy and in a really good place at the moment. Um, I have been finishing off loads of stuff that I owe other people. And that has enabled me to do more stuff uh, connected to my goals. Um, So... Yeah, I mean, this week um, I've worked on Trey. I'm working on the final version of that. Um, I have been working in the background on starting a new thing for my fiction. Um, I'm not ready to talk about that yet, um, but I will soon. Um, Today is uh, the judging day for Amazon Kindle Storyteller. So it's Friday the 8th of October. So I will be doing that today as well. Working on launch stuff um, for the audiobooks. So next week you will find uh, on Monday, Monday, a hour, over an hour long episode, special episode on uh, all the lessons I've learned narrating. Um, And I have even done like voices and things in there, like performance stuff. Now, listen, I don't profess to be an expert at this. This is literally the things that I have learned um, over the course of trying to pull this audiobook together. Um, So yeah, you can take the advice, you can leave it, you can just listen to it for shits and giggles. Um, Another thing that I've decided to do is to do a one hour one to one uh, voice coaching session just for fun. Like, I don't know if I will ever do my fiction in audiobook. Um, Probably not because it's possibly not the best use of my time. But um, 
I want to learn the stuff for fun. I really enjoyed the performance as aspect of doing the audiobook and, you know, maybe I can bring that into narrating the Anatomy of Prose, which will be the next one I do. So um, yeah, I, I will probably do that next month, actually, I think. So going into next week, then I am going to continue to work on Trey and getting that finished. Um, I really would like to get it done before the end of October, so that I can work on the scent of death in Nano. Um, so that is my hope and my plan. I am right in the crunch point of where I'm making most of the changes. So things have slowed a little. That is a bit frustrating for me um, but I'm doing the work and that is the important thing. Um, another exciting thing I am finally gonna get on a plane. I am so excited. I don't know if I said this last week. Maybe I said this last week. I don't know. But um, anyway, Monday. No, I couldn't have done because I booked the flights on Monday. Yeah, so Monday I booked flights to go and see my dad. I have not seen him since I left my day job, which is shocking because although Okay, I mean, it's two and a half years, um, almost exactly two and a half years, actually. Um, but I am such a different person from the day that I walked out of my day job. I was really crushed. I, you know, was a very small shell of a human when I left my day job. I had been crushed mentally for a really long time. And I am not that person anymore. And I can't believe that I haven't been able to see my dad as I've gone on this journey. Um, so yeah, I'm really looking forward to seeing him and we are going in the half term week in the UK here. So like more or less the last week of October. So yeah, I am super excited for that. Um, but it also means I need to smash out the edits on Trey in the next couple of weeks if possible. So yeah, that is where I am focusing most of my time. Um, I'm pulling back a little bit on social media and things and my inbox. <laughs> <laughs> no surprise there, so that I can focus on getting this done. Um, yeah, and I've started to think about next year and the things that I'm going to do and and what next year is going to look like. So yeah, I don't know if you can hear it, but I am just filled with joy. I'm so happy. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I'm just in a really good spot right now. So I hope that, yeah, I can fill your day with a little bit of joy. Okay, so the Rebel of the Week this week is Andy Park. Andy says, greetings from Canada. I'm not sure whether I uh, qualify as a Rebel of the Week. If I were a Rebel, I'd probably be a sleeper agent. On the other hand, I have been doing some stuff that might be considered sacrilegious, if not rebellious, in the academic circles that have been my stomping ground for the last 18 years. When I first became a, pres a, a, pressure, a professor, it was like winning the academic lo lottery. I mean, tenure track, job for life, come on. But as the old 80s band ABC would say, that was then and this is now. After about 15 years, I started getting a serious itch to leave the, uh, leave the academy. In part, it was the failure of my research to make tangible inroads in my chosen field, sustainable forest ma management and conservation. But the soul crushing boredom of correcting the same undergraduate writing mistakes year after year also played its part. And go don't get me started on administration, both the activity and the office holders. I've always rebelled in minor ways against the conventional stereotype of a tenured professor slash scientist. I sat on the boards of conservation groups. I ran as a candidate for the Green Party of Canada. Oh, that is awesome. I gasp, took some time off, all of which was great, except I began to see my well renumerated day job as an obstacle to participating in these other more enjoyable activities. Then about five years ago, I was walking through downtown Montreal and I had an, when I had an idea, which is not something that happens to me all that often. So I took note and acted. The particular idea arrived in the form of characters inhibiting scenarios and events in a reasonably far future Earth. When I got home, I announced I was going to write a book and the rest is history that is still to be made. The next few years were filled with early morning writing sessions, obsessive consumption of writing books and blogs, Ursula Le Guin, Le Guin uh, Chuck Wendig, Donald mass Stephen King and ears glued to podcasts writing excuses the creative pen and now rebel author 
I plotted pants and planced my way through the first draft of the novel and I'm close to finishing the second draft. Along the way, my retirement plans changed. That is, I started to have some. Among other things, I enrolled in and completed a professional editing certificate at Simon Fraser University. This will allow me to continue to use the skills I've acquired over 20 plus years of research and teaching, except now I'll be able to use them to help people rather than having to grade them and sit in judgment. As for the history, that is still yet to be made. Well, that involves morphing my novel of a monstrous 150,000 word draft that refuses to be tamed into a svelte 120,000 uh, word published work that hopefully brings in some coin. And, um... Uh, maybe my novel represents my biggest re rebellion of all because over the years I've realised that while research is important, most people respond to stories over facts. So in search of getting some traction in the world of conservation, this rebel author has turned to fiction. I love that. I love that you're a uh, professor and that you are rebelling and that it's turned into a second career for you. I think that is fantastic. Thank you so much for the rebellion. And if you would like to be a rebel of the week, please do send in your story really now. Please do send them in because I am getting low again. Um, it can be any kind of story, big, small, or something in between. You can email your rebel author story to rebelauthorpodcast at gmail.com or you can Instagram me at Sasha Black Author. A big thank you to new patron Luke Condor and thank you Luke I know you we know each other and you're also a patron of the Next Level Author podcast so thank you very much I really do appreciate that and thank you to Jeff Elkins who edited his pledge up and joined us in the Rebel Slack group which is the rowdiest, <laughs> most supportive, uh, brilliant Slack I have ever had the privilege of being part of. So thank you uh, both. And of course, a massive thank you to all my existing patrons. If you would like to support the show and get early access to all of the episodes as well as bonus stuff like Poison and Prose sessions, bloopers um, and uh, Silent Septembers when they happen, then you can from as little as $2 a month by visiting patreon.com forward slash Sasha Black. Okay, I think that's it from me this week. So um, sorry about my WhatsApp in the background there. Um, yeah, we will crack on with the episode. Hello and welcome to the Rebel Author Podcast. Today I am joined by a returning Rebel guest, Becca Puglisi. Becca Ooh. is an international speaker, writing coach and best-selling author of The Emotion Thesaurus and other resources for writers. Her books have sold over 700 thousand copies and are available in multiple languages and are sourced by US universities and are used by novelists, screenwriters, editors and psychologists around the world. She is passionate about learning and sharing her knowledge with others through her Writers Helping Writers blog and via One Stop for Writers, a powerhouse online resource for authors that's home to the character builder and storytellers roadmap tools. Hello and welcome back. So excited. It's been a long time. It feels like it's been a year, so I guess it's been a lot going on. So it, it has. It's been just, I think it's been just over a year. So um, if anybody would like to listen to the first episode Becca was on, it was episode 43. And we back then we were talking about occupations. And I remember that um I had a bit of an epiphany about one of my characters after reading um an advanced copy of the book. I now have it on my um shelf in hard copy. Um That's you so can cool. see all my all my I have the full house, of course. Um and uh yeah, and uh, it, that really changed the book. Uh, funnily enough, the book has now changed radically since then. But anyway, um, <laughs> it did make a huge difference. And so um, I was lucky enough to read your upcoming release, All About Conflict. So would you like to tell everyone, I guess, like what you have been up to in the last year and a bit since we spoke? Yeah, we, uh, Angela and I have been super busy as always. Um, we were really focused on a couple of developments at One Stop for Writers. One of the things that we put out was a storytelling roadmap because we had so many people who would come to the site. I have this idea. I want to write this book, uh, but I don't know like how. I don't know how to get there. And they were just, they were coming to us with such big, basically like writing coach questions, which we don't do individually. You know, we just don't have the time um, for that. So we created uh, 
it's basically three different tools that you can look at to help you plan, write, and revise your novel. It goes from start to finish. Here's what you do first. Then you move to this. Then you move to this. And we're really hoping that that's going to help people um, kind of uh, give them, guide them through that process and make it a little less daunting. So that took um, quite a bit of time. We've been, we just, that came out like, I guess about a month ago. Um, we've been hiring people. We're so excited to add to our team, both at uh, Writers Helping Writers and then at One Stop for Writers. And then of course the Conflict of Source that's coming out um, in October. So it's been a lot. It's been a year. usual. Yeah, <laughs> every, every year is a bit crazy that's at the right. moment. <laughs> Um, okay, well, we are here to talk about conflict. So would you like to start by telling everyone a little bit about your new um, thesauri and when they can get it, where they can get it, all of that good stuff? I would love to, because I got this. <gasps> OMG. Awesome. That is so um, pretty. We're so excited. Every time we do this, I mean, this is our our ninth book, if you count the, the little e-booklet. And every time it comes to like picking out the color, Angela and I are like, Oh my gosh, like how do you, there are only so many colors. Why did we like go this route, you know? And so we went with, um, with gold and there's going to actually be a second volume next year. So gold and silver, but we, uh, it, it's, it's awesome. It has 110 conflict scenarios that you could use in your story. And the front matter is all about um, how you use conflict on a story and a scene level, like how it plays into the overall story that you're writing, but also how it really should be a critical factor for each scene and kind of the structure of that. Um, we talk a lot about internal conflict and how important that is because conflict is not only there to bolster your, your story, your plot, it's actually key to character development, which I think was uh, like an aha moment for us when we were nutting out what we were gonna write about and we were kind of researching and realized that that is a really big thing that a lot of people don't consider. We think that you know it's just there for structure but really it has a lot to do with the character arc. It's so funny because um, over time, I have realized that my favorite type of villain, like in air quotes, is internal conflict or that like mm -hmm. internal flaw. And um, a few people have asked if I am ever gonna do a second edition of uh, my villains book. Nice. And if I do, uh, which I'm not gonna do just yet because I have just finished the audio book and oh my goodness me, I do not need that trauma right now. No. Um, but yeah, if I do, there will be a whole chapter on internal conflict because I think it's something that I've learned more and more about and have come to appreciate on a much deeper level um, than I ever did when I when I first started writing. So yeah, I love um, that you included uh, that in, in your book as well. So, um, like, let's start with the basics. Like, what is story conflict and why is it so crucial to writing a good novel? Um, it's kind of hard to define because a lot of people have different ideas about what it is. And I just think of it as opposition. Um, sometimes conflict is, is external and really obvious. It's, it's the other person, you know, the villain or the antagonist that's blocking the, pro the protagonist or it's a weather event or a physical roadblock. Um, those are the really kind of overt kinds of conflict, but that internal conflict is, it's just as important. Um, that is its own kind of opposition. It's the character doubting what they're, what, what they're able to do um, or what they are doing, like the choices that they have made, the, the moral dilemmas that come up about right or wrong when they have certain choices. Um, no win scenarios that, that put them in an impossible situation, but they still have to choose or act. Those are internal oppositions. They're things that the, the character is fighting against that are, are keeping them from fully embracing what they need to do and move forward. And so that's kind of how I think of conflict, that it's that it's whatever is, is opposing and, and, and kind of making it more difficult for the character to do what they need to do. I think the internal conflicts, like you said, are, I think they're the most compelling because mm -hmm. for the, for one thing, we all can, we can't always relate to the external, you know, I've never been stuck in a blizzard or things like that. I've never had to escape civil unrest. So I can't relate to that, but, but I can relate to a character who is going through those kind of internal things. And so internal conflict is really important for engaging with readers. Um, but I do believe that it's also important because it scrapes away at, at the character's most foundational ideas about who they are and what they believe 
and what they know about the world and other people. And when you start messing with those foundational things, the whole house of cards is threatened, right? So I think that's why it's it's super important to, to really think about the conflict that you're using and, and kind of get that piece right. Yeah, I think internal conflict is one of those tools as well that you can use to um, like layer conflict because often in these big sprawling fantasy for example jo- uh, genres or like thrillers where like the world's gonna end or someone's gonna get assassinated right. or whatever it, it just helps to like layer the the depth of your plot your story your conflict your characters so yeah um all right so what advice do you have about making sure that conflict is relevant to the character and not just like a plot device yeah i think that's where the stakes come in. I think that's why that's a really important piece to consider because you can throw all kinds of things at the character. Like you're saying, they can be big and like epic or they can be small minor things. But if it, if it's, if it doesn't create a real risk or threat, then why does it matter? So I think that's, that's kind of how you make sure that you're using the right kinds of conflict is that first of all, they're, they're in some way personal. They are impacting the character they're, they're either blocking them from, from the overt goal, the story goal that they have, their outer motivation, or they're, um, they're messing with the internal motivation, with it, whatever it is that's, that's driving the character towards reaching for that outer motivation. If you can provide a conflict that kind of digs at that, that is gonna, that's going to make them stop because they, they don't want to have to deal with that. They don't want to have to look too closely at that, and it's going to cause them to kind of dig in their heels Um, and that's where I think it's, it's really fascinating because, you know, you've got this character who's, who's pursuing this goal, but if you can use the right kinds of conflict, you can actually make them stop pursuing Mm. that goal or, or question why they're doing it or or whether or not it's worth it, even though they know it's, it's vitally important or they wouldn't be pursuing it because it's going to fulfill some inner need that they have. So personal, personal stakes, making sure that, um, it's something that is is really going to to affect them either because you know it's going to block them from the goal which we now know is super important that they don't get it then that's going to be a problem or because it's going to impact someone around them you know i mean so many times what's at stake is not just affecting the character it's it's when it's touching other people and the important people in their lives that it becomes um, very important and so picking the conflicts that yes are going to contribute to your plot and block them in some way, make things more difficult, create more tension. That's absolutely good. But you got to make sure that the stakes are right. Um, And if they're not, then you need to look at your conflict device and see if it's actually the right choice for for that scene or for that character. Yeah. And in your book, you've got like a ton of different um, examples, like of different stakes and different types of conflict, different people types of conflict as well generators right. in there so like you, you really probably ought to go and like just read the book because that there is a wealth of detail on this um if you do struggle with uh, creating the right stakes or um uh, conflict um okay so what advice uh, uh sorry i'm about to reread my same question there <laughs> how do you it's been a long day um, how do you build conflict so that it escalates naturally but still like and still has an impact without looking forced or rushed or contrived um this is it's a it's a great question it's not something that we um we address directly in this book because we couldn't fit everything into one volume um so we just kind of chose okay well how do we have all this information on conflict we need two books. Um, so we, we kind of focus for this one on um, how conflict really impacts the character. And there's, there's plot stuff in here too, but the second one is really gonna focus more on conflict as a, as, a, as a help for the plot. Okay, one thing for sure that you wanna use if you're talking about um, making sure that your conflict is natural and not forced is the rule of three. You know, you've got um, in each scene, if you can have three different conflicts that are related somehow to the character scene goal, um, which is of course gonna be related to their overall goal. So it all ties in together. That's a really good way because then you can be sure that you are, um, you're escalating and that you are using conflicts that make sense and you're not just pulling in. As authors, I know we always have to be careful that we're not just choosing elements and aspects that we think are cool, Mm -hmm. you know, or that we've seen before or that are personal for us and like meaningful for us. 
that using actually planning out in your scene, here are the three conflicts that are going to happen along the way that are going to either cause problems for my character or provide opportunities for them to step up and do the right thing. Um, so when you map them out, then you're sure that you're actually choosing conflict scenarios that, that are, they're going to escalate. They're going to, it's not, they're not all the same level of intensity and they're going to lead into each other, which is a lot, something that I didn't realize before I started doing more planning is that this part of it, when you just look at, okay, I'm just going to, this, this, and this is what's going to happen in the scene. And you can make sure that they are connected and not just random. We have a tool at, um, at One Step for Writers called it's a worksheet. It's called the emotional progression of a scene. And it basically is a, just something that you print out and you can write in, okay, here's where we are at the start of the scene. And here's my character's emotion at the start of the scene. Here's what happens to them first. Here's the second conflict. Here's the third conflict. And here's where they are at the end of the scene. So just something like that can, can help you create a framework and just make it easier to kind of picture how the scene is going to lay out. Um, I know Save the Cat, which I love, his whole technique of creating an index card for each scene where you record certain things that, that you need to keep track of and make sure that you're you know, touching on. There's lots of things he says you can put on those individual scene cards, but that's something that somebody could use to track. Here's my three conflicts. Here's what they're, they're going for. And then here are the three things that are going to get in their way. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of different techniques, but I do think that keeping that rule of three in mind is um, really important for, for, for helping you know that your, your conflicts make sense. It's just a, it's the planning piece that I know a lot of people may not love, but... But it doesn't course. matter when you plan, because you can, like, regard, regardless of whether you plan in advance or you, you know, it's something that you do right. whilst you edit, you can still get that that in. One of the um, things that I am obsessed with at the moment is theme. And mm -hmm. um, so I like to not only make sure that every like side character every character is a spin on the theme but that the conflicts are also spins on the theme so each different mm. character whatever their variation of the theme like in like ta their tangible version of the theme whatever question they're answering like if if they are a representation of the theme then their conflict should be a representation of the theme as well and so that mm -hmm. is another way to like make it all connect and give that kind of really holistic like a uh, gestalt type feeling like the book is the whole yep. the whole is more than the sum of its parts um okay so you you've kind of talked a little bit about this but like what strategies can writers use for layering conflict um, yeah, I think that it's important, as you mentioned, to use um, different kinds of conflict. And we have, of course, you have the standard, you know, man versus nature, um, you know, man versus technology, man versus um, society and all the, the kind of standard things that you learned in school. Um, and you can absolutely use those. We have in the book, we, we just to make it manageable, we broke it into categories. So we have relationship friction. Those are all the conflicts that really cause problems um, with the, the people in your lives, duty and responsibility, moral dilemmas, mm -hmm. um, failures and mistakes. Those are huge. So if you can use, if, if you're always using, say, relationship friction, you know, yes, it may be compelling at first, but it's, it's on some level, it's going to get a little tired after a while. And it's just not going to have that depth, which you're talking about with layering. So if you can choose conflicts from different um, categories then you're ensuring that what's happening, it actually has a bigger impact. You know, it's not just affecting this one little part of the character's life. It's actually like, you know, touching everything and creating all kinds of tremors that are going to be a real, real problem for them as they escalate. So I think that's the first thing is different kinds of conflict. But then, of course, the levels of conflict, you want to make sure that you're not only using those earth shattering, like catastrophic events. I mean, really how often should those come into play in, in your story? Um, it's often the, the little things that, you know, can start a, a kind of a domino effect for a character in a scene, or ironically, it can be the, the last thing, you know, when this and this and this happens, and then, you know, you lose your keys and it just, and they, they completely lose it. So just different levels of conflict. And I think um, it's good when you're talking about layers, you know, to pile it all on at once, instead of spreading it out, you know, make sure that it's coming. I'm watching, um, I'm watching Breaking Bad, my husband, it's his favorite show ever. He's watched the whole thing like five times. And I, 
I really don't like anti-hero stories because yeah. I just feel like I'm being manipulated to like somebody that I, I shouldn't want to be rooting for. And by the end, you know, I'm just like, oh, this guy just needs to go away. He's, he's so awful. But I see it every episode. I mean, it's just like, bam, bam, bam. It never stops for whoever it is. Um, so I think that, that that's also important is, is it is good, you know, to have a kind of a, they go through one thing and then it kind of, you know, you have that ebb and then they hit, get hit with another thing. But when you can hit them all at once, that's always good too. Oh, I love anti-heroes and I absolutely Let's love know, it. I feel bad. <laughs> I, I know. Breaking it's like bad. a character flaw. <laughs> have you, how close, everybody. how close are you to the end? I have four episodes left. Oh my goodness me. <laughs> I know oh, that and is I'm big. literally at this point oh. like just please just let him die I'm just <laughs> waiting I'm like his wife I'm waiting for him to die <laughs> no, so comment. <laughs> <laughs> no comment no <laughs> comment oh I definitely can't wait to see a Facebook post from you when you finished it though oh, that's all oh, I'm gonna yeah. say <laughs> I did I just I just posted about it a few days ago and there was a lively conversation it's uh very people have very strong opinions about that show it's kind they of do they do um what was I gonna say oh yeah one of the other ones uh, that you've put in the book is Maslow's hierarchy of needs which I think is always a great one mm. for like on an individual basis like looking at well I suppose you can actually apply it globally as well but um yeah for for helping writers to um uh, layer layer conflict so that's another reason you want to go and get the book um Okay, so let's talk about now, like more that line level, like scene level. Um, how, what tips or advice have you got for um, helping writers to show internal conflict? Yeah, I think with the internal conflict, it's you have to get a good grip on the subtext because you've got internal conflict is something that characters aren't going to want to like be forthright about. You know, it's doubts, it's insecurities, it's um, second guessing, um, it's, am I able, am I worthy? So these are, you know, these kinds of, of things, they're not going to want other people to know it's going to make them feel weak and vulnerable. Um, so they're going to kind of keep that on the inside, but we can see when you can see what they're saying on the outside, and then you can see how it conflicts with what is happening through their, through their thoughts and through, um, kind of the things that they are, that is happening for them mentally. So, we have to be able to show um, not just what's happening outside, which is going to convey confidence and capability. You've got to show what's going on inside the character. So think about um, their thoughts. You know, their thoughts are going to return to whatever it is that they're struggling with, even though they're not referencing that externally. So obsessive thoughts um, mm -hmm. about certain decisions or situations, whatever it is that is causing that internal conflict, you're going to be able to get it across very clearly with those kind of cyclical thoughts that keep going back and back over the same material. Um, think about avoidance. Um, what things are they avoiding? What people, what topics of conversation, what situations? Um, and that's something that, that you actually can, can kind of see from the outside. You know, if the character's going along and, and things are fine, and then all of a sudden they're, they're trying to avoid a certain person or situation, then that is a clue then to readers that something is going on. And then when you, when you combine that with other clues, then it becomes obvious, you know, what's, what's happening. Um, indecision, when they're wavering in their course of action, um, especially for a character who is typically a decisive kind of um, type A person who is always knowing what to do when they don't know what to do. And, and you can show that, that um, maybe they're, they're waffling, uh, maybe they're putting off making a decision, whatever it looks like, you can show externally what's happening on the inside there. And then of course, insecurity and, and self-doubt. Um, just whatever the characters tell is, you know, for when they're feeling insecure or when they are doubting themselves, uh, if you can figure out what that is and, and use it throughout as, a, as a, a cue basically to the reader to say, this is, this is insecurity. This is where they're, they're doubting themselves and they're not sure. Then you kind of set up a roadmap for, for for readers to to understand what the different things are about your character that trigger or that that si signal those things are happening, mm -hmm. so you really have to be able to to get into those internal pieces and and show the reader, but then also show how it's it's kind of slipping through into the external cues. Mm. I also think it's really important not to rush that bit because I think so sometimes writers can just throw out like the odd 
line or whatever and think that that's enough and and actually that internal piece is the bit that the reader connects to and so giving yourself a paragraph or like not worrying if sort of you know it gets that that indecision spreads over a couple of chapters like obviously you don't want to slow the pace of your story but like sometimes just one line or just one quip or just one I'm not sure isn't actually enough like this internal anguish should be really pulling at your character and yeah like I don't know I don't know about you but sometimes I see that indecision come across too quickly or the obsessive like it just comes and goes and and that isn't realistic like as humans when we're unsure we can be unsure for a while and you have 400 yeah. pages so like don't don't rush right. that bit the, the the point is to create an arc across the book so you know yes. it's okay if it takes a while and on that note like and I didn't prepare you for this question so I'm sorry Lovely. <laughs> um, sorry and um, what what are like the most common mistakes you see with conflict like are there other uh mistakes that you see um again i think part of it is the people assume that um you know that that the conflict has to be epic for it to be impactful and that's so opposite really of of what's true because it's just the little things little things piling up or little things around an area of insecurity that happen that are going to have a problem cause a problem for your character so Um, I do think that that's a big one. And I I think that um, um, people who, who, again, are choosing conflict randomly and not being really deliberate about it. Mm. um, That's when the conflict, it seems a little um, like it it doesn't quite fit. Um, I'm watching this other show, which I won't name because I'm going to say bad things about it, but (laughs) it's... uh, very entertaining, but from a storytelling perspective, it, it drives me a little crazy because there's so much drama. Like everything is like this huge thing and it, it feels very contrived and it doesn't fit into what I believe is the actual narrative that is going on with the people in the story. So again, tying the conflict into the individual person, the, the, the viewpoint character in that scene, um, I think a lot of people don't do that. And, and I understand that's kind of a relatively new revelation for me um so I think that that's that's a big one yeah okay how can writers because you mentioned this a little bit earlier um, about character failures but there's quite a big section in the book about failure um so how can like how can a writer use character failures to like augment conflict and character growth and and sort of help the plot this I think is the coolest thing that I discovered when I was writing this book and I was wouldn't Angela and I were writing this book. Um, character arc is, is all about the character's growth or failure, depending on what kind of arc you're writing. But just to keep things concise, we'll talk about a change arc. A change arc is, is all about the flaw. It's, it's whatever the wounding event was that happened in the past that has created these dysfunctional behaviors and habits and ideas that the character has that they think are actually keeping them safe and protecting them, but they're actually causing more problems. They're keeping them from um, developing deep and meaningful relationships that are are healthy. They're keeping them from pursuing whatever is going to make them truly happy. Um, And they don't know at the start of the story that that is a problem. Or if they do, they don't care. They're like committed to whatever coping mechanisms they have been using, they are gonna stick with it. So as the story goes along, they are going to have opportunities to recognize that flaw and realize, oh, wait a minute, you know, common denominator here. This is maybe me and what I'm doing right here. It's causing this problem. And maybe this is something that I need to deal with. And then as the story goes along, they're going to have opportunities to take action to the situations are going to arise where they can either fall back to their old ways, or they can um, take new action and adopt a new mechanism, a new uh, response and develop new habits, healthy habits. And by the end of the story, of course, they're, you know, they're doing much better and they are um, fully realized because they have dealt with the things that they needed to deal with and they have, they have grown and evolved. Conflict is actually the vehicle that you use to provide those opportunities. Things happen and they create choices where the character has to make a decision. They can either go this way or they can go that way. They can stay and continue in what they've been doing or they can try something new. 
Um, they can do what they know is uh, the best thing, but it's really hard, or they can do what they, they know isn't gonna really work well for them, but it's just easy and it's what they've always done. So that's how conflict, in my opinion, ties into character growth. Because as you are planning out their character arc and planning out their story, the conflict opportunities that you place in their way are really opportunities for growth. And in the beginning, they're gonna fail every time. They're gonna, they're gonna choose the old way. They're gonna choose not to grow. Um, but then as the story goes along, then they realize what the problem is. And then they start to take baby steps, you know, and sometimes they're gonna, they're gonna move forward and they're going to make the right choice. And then they're gonna revert again as the conflict grows and the stakes get higher and they're more afraid of failure and because the stakes are so personal, it's very important for them to get it right. They're going to fall back. They're going to revert to their old ways until at the end of the story, they have hopefully in a, in a full change arc, you know, they have fully embraced who they need to be, what they need to be doing. Um, and then they have achieved, you know, their growth and, and whatever it is that they needed to achieve for, for the story. I love um, looking at those scenes in in a book where, um, and I don't think I realized that I really like this moment in a book until I was listening to you talking just then. But that that moment of, um, you, there are multiple failures and bad choices throughout the book. And then there's one scene where somebody will do something, say something, or um, <clears throat> the character, uh, will have some kind of a realization and they'll like that realization moment where they flip from, oh, okay, I need to make the good choice now, not the bad choice or, oh, oh, I was a dick. I realize what I've done now, you know, like that moment, like, and the thing that I, I think I both love it and also struggle a little with it, but is choosing the action or moment or scene that, pushes the character into the flip like what like that moment or that that scene or what is it that is significant enough that it pushes the character the other way and I suppose you know I suppose we're really talking about what is it that nudges them into the dark night of the soul because that's usually where that flip that flip right. comes um but yeah I love that moment so much like that it's really like a, a heartbeat in, in the book. It's a stop, a pause, a breathe, a, a, like a breath. But yeah, anyway, I was just like, wow, I didn't realize I loved that moment so much. But like, yeah, listening to you talk, I'm like, yeah, that's one of my favorite bits of, of every book. Um, and so you mentioned choice in there um, and uh, how characters should face choices. But like, I think um, from memory, I have read it a little while ago now, but there, um, you talk a bit about complicating choice and how um, that can help to further tension. So I wondered if you could just talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so conflict leads to choices, which lead to consequences. The consequences can be good or the consequences can be, can be bad. And that just goes back to how we use conflict to augment character growth. We as authors provide the conflict and over the course of the story, the character hopefully evolves to the point of making primarily good and healthy choices instead of the dysfunctional ones. The more complicated the choice is, the more tension you're gonna have um, because it's not easy and it's not gonna be something that they can just you know, figure out right away. They're gonna have to, like you said, stop and pause and think. I love that in, a lot of structure, uh, story structure models, you have the catalyst at the beginning, which is, you know, this big, huge conflict because the character has to make a decision. Do I move forward into a new situation or do I stay, do I stay where I am? And most structure models have uh, a period built in right after the conflict that's called like the debate where they have to figure it out. And just like you said, characters need time. We need as authors to give them that stage time to figure out and to go through their, their mental process and weigh the pros and cons. Um, sometimes they, it's interesting when, when they, they think things through wrongly because they are working off of assumptions or biases or um, out of fear, a place of fear. And so they're going to kind of read the whole thing wrong and that's gonna have to recalibrate it at some point throughout the rest of the story. But they have to have time to work through those things. And so it's important that we do offer choices that are not um, super basic. And this is where it goes back to that layering and figuring out levels of, of intensities. A lot of times this comes down to the kinds of choices that we're providing. Simple choices are um, like 
win-win, you know, where there's really not a bad choice. You do have to make a choice, but there's, there's not really a bad scenario. Um, even a win-lose. I mean, it's obvious which one you should do. So even if they have to think about it a little bit, there's not a whole lot of, of compelling nature with that kind of a choice, but we have to include those. I mean, we can't, everything again, can't be a big agonizing decision or you're gonna exhaust your reader and the story's just gonna get overblown and bloated. But then you start getting into more complicated choices um, like a dilemma. A dilemma, I'm gonna skip to my part of the book that has this information, is um, a choice that doesn't have a clear, good answer. It's something, it's a, dile dile it's a dilemma because you don't know um, what to do. When there's no ideal choice, you basically have um, a lot of thinking to do, you know, and especially if you, if you add a ticking clock, then that you have really layered conflict because you've got um, decisions that really require some thought, but then you don't have a lot of time to do that. It adds an extra, um, an extra layer of conflict. So you have dilemmas. And then there's thing we discovered called a Hobson's choice. This is when you're offered something that you don't really want, but maybe it's slightly better than what you currently have. So it's like, okay, well, I'm not really happy with my current situation. I can stay with that or I can take this, which I guess it's a little better. Is it really worth, you know, the, the, the risk of, of doing something new? And then of course you get into the agonizing choices. Um, that's the Sophie's choice that we're all familiar with where there is no good solution. Whatever you choose, you lose. I mean, that's a heart wrenching kind of a situation. Another one is a Morton's fork choice. And this is where both options lead to the same end. Um, so you have two different options, but they're both equally terrible and, and give you the same result. Um, moral choices very often can be a very complicated choice, even though it's, it's, it's simple from the outside, when it touches on what you've always believed or what you think about right and wrong, um, religious questions, a lot of times people who are very religious, you know, are when they have to struggle with, oh my gosh, is I've what I've believed my whole life is, is it not true? Um, moral choices are very often very complicated. So um, if you can think about different, different kinds of conflict, yes, but, but you want to you wanna make sure that they're not all super simple and that they're not all crazy complicated, but you do want to layer in different um, levels there. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much. So the ultimate question, <laughs> um, this is the Rebel Author Podcast. Uh, so tell everyone about <laughs> a time you unleashed your inner rebel. Now, last time you talked about the police drive off. So I don't know if you oh wanted gosh. to give me another one. You are free to use one from, from your husband or from Angela, if you like. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> well, um, you know what? I, 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 when it comes to being a rebel, I'm, I'm a little boring. I'm, I'm just, you know, I play it safe and I, uh, maybe I'm just a little lazy and I would rather be sitting on the couch in my pajamas. <laughs> um, but there was a time and I have to go back to my husband because he is really the driving force behind most of my bad decisions. I mean, I can just <laughs> say that I think with, <laughs> with all truth. Um, we had in college, uh, his sister was, lived in the same apartment complex and my husband was not like, we were dating at the time, but he was not totally crazy about her boyfriend. Um, and so he was at his sister's house. And so Al said, you know what? We need to go like do something to his car. So I know where there's a loose parking block, you know, the blocks that you pull up against in the front of the parking space. Let's go get it and, and we'll go and put it behind his car so that, you know, he can't get out and then he can't move it by himself. So what's he going to do? So this is that kind of the way my husband's brain works. I mean, this is just <laughs> why I fell in love with him. So we do, we go out and we get this block. It is insanely heavy, like crazy, crazy heavy. We have to walk, you know, down the street and around the corner. And as we're going, a police car pulls up <laughs> behind <laughs> us. And it was so ridiculous. I mean, we're standing in the middle of the, the parking lot, clearly up to no good, you know, and he's just kind of looking at us like, I'd like to hear what you have to say about this. <laughs> so, you know, we had to put it down and explain, you know, just a friend, you know, we're just playing a prank. And he's like, well, 
stop. She'll put it back. Oh, man. And we had to go back and we didn't get to do our prank. But that was my first run in with the law, you know, like <laughs> 19 years old. I had never had any problems. And I was like scandalized. Like, you're going to get me in jail or you know, <laughs> criminal record. What's wrong with you? And yet you still married him. <laughs> That's right. Button, Amazing. Button I love it. I love it. He no, that's a fun. hilarious re- rebellion. I uh, I love playing pranks. So yeah, I, I highly approve of your mischievous <laughs> behavior. <laughs> I don't know how, like, how do you know that there's a loose parking block? Like, do you, you don't, do you walk around and test them to find one deliberately so that you can then use it? Like, what? How, whose brain works that way? She's awesome. Amazing. Um, well, tell everyone where they can find out more about you and your books and anything else that you would like to add. Uh, yes, writershelpingwriters.net is our blog address. And we have a bookstore there where you can find information about the new book, um, when it's going to be released. And then we'll be posting, of course, um, purchasing options there as soon as those become available. October 12th is the day for that. And then One Stop for Writers is our comprehensive um, website for writers where we take basically our contents from our books, we put them all together, we create some tools that can help you, you know, build characters and write your story and, and all of that. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Thank and, you. And of course, thank you so much to everybody listening and a whopping thank you to all of the show's patrons. If you would like to get early access to all of the episodes, as well as stacks of bonus content, then you can by visiting patreon.com forward slash Sasha Black. I'm Sasha Black. You are listening to Becca Puglisi, and this was the Rebel Author Podcast. Join me next week. I am super excited uh, to share with you next week's interview. I speak to Anna McNuff, who is the Kindle Storyteller 2020 award winner, um, and she is an adventurer. Um, she is a sort of narrative nonfiction writer, children's book writer, um, adventurer. Yeah, and she has pink hair, and she's amazing, and she's fun and exciting and funny and yeah like you are gonna love next week's episode um so yeah join me next week for that don't forget to tune in and subscribe on your podcatcher and when you have a moment please leave a review